Hello, and welcome to the Bite Size Theology Podcast, Extended Edition, Episode 28. Coming to you from three fellas who are straight up awful. <laughs> just cut, cut to the heart of it, Aaron. I love it. <laughs> That's all. I don't. Who even needs a joke? Let's just call it what it is. You know what I mean? Coming, to, coming to you from three guys who were bad. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> just jump to the conclusion there. It is Friday, the twenty fourth of April. I'm your host, Aaron Lively. Joining me this week is Sage Blaylock. How's it going? And John McCord. I really, I've got nothing to say. <laughs> Usually, you know, try to make a joke off off your joke, but it's calling somebody awful. <laughs> There's not really much. Uh, all you fair. can say is like, yeah, you're straight up right. <laughs> yeah, fair enough, you know. maybe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's true. We all know it. Uh, so what day is it? Do you guys remember? I can't even remember where we're at or who we are. I, what's, who, who are you guys? Where am I? <laughs> People. I see people. <laughs> <laughs> what is this? So what, what do you mean by days exactly? I, I, I don't understand. Um, I don't really know either. I feel like that's just a part of my language that like, I, I still have in my head. It doesn't mean anything, though. It's to, like, be, to be fair, biblical scholars have argued over the meaning of days for a long time. That's, long that's true. We're, yeah. This definitely feels like day-age theory. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah these don't feel like literal 24 hour days let me definitely you. not no this this definitely feels like a thousand years to the lord if you catch my meaning <laughs> <laughs> all right well uh we have to do our our tradition i, I want to call it a tradition now i need you all to rate your quarantine experience now <laughs> Now that it's been two more weeks since we've been doing this and since we gave our last ratings, rate it on a scale of one to 10 or you're dead to me. <laughs> um, what was my last one? Like a two or something? I can't even remember what my last Yeah, I believe, I believe you went two. You were right around. I think you were at a 10 and then the Lydia yeah, that's right. work happened. Yeah. And now yeah. Two. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm like at a 1.7. I'm slowly declining, you know, <laughs> Lydia's still working all the time and we like our schedules very rarely intersect. So we don't get to see each other all that much. And so I'm just, I'm wasting away. <laughs> it's like the end of Avengers, but more slowly. <laughs> She's like little, little parts. Of it. <laughs> oh, that's great news, man. Yeah. 1.7. So, you know, hopefully I'm not dead to you. Sage, that's the score to beat. <laughs> well, I, I guess I'm going to beat it. Uh, it's the last time I was an 8.75. Uh, <laughs> I so, still have find that hard to believe. Yeah, I mean, so my hair continues to grow, and I can't get it cut anywhere, and that's really difficult for me. Uh, <laughs> I have to use larger and larger amounts of uh, two-in-one uh, to clean my hair, and it's, it's really bothering me. Uh, I like to make those things last for a long time. So I would say I'm from an 8.75 to probably like a 7.866 repeat. That's unacceptable. <laughs> it's between it's between 1 and 10. Tell me I'm wrong. Well, fair enough. <laughs> I, I don't I, care that much to argue. <laughs> <laughs> me neither <laughs> okay so steady decline and it's the only reason because your hair's getting longer i mean that's certainly the biggest reason uh honestly i can't think of any other reasons i think that's it <laughs> <laughs> all right fair enough yeah. aaron what about you i see that your hair continues to grow as well yeah i don't cons i mean that's nothing new i haven't cut it in like a year and a half so so that doesn't really affect me that much uh yeah i feel like uh ichabod crane like like that's who you are right now and you're in the <laughs> middle so like while he's out for 100 years that's you it's just like he's out and he decided to be in a podcast but yeah, you that's... are his personality uh i guess like his subconscious it would be uh that's uh recording a podcast while he's out for 100 years you guys get me i don't no. know what you're talking about no you went sleepy hollow and freud I lost you in the <laughs> translation. <laughs> oh, 
was, one thing I, I thought it was a pretty it. seamless transition. I don't know <laughs> what I don't know what the problem was. was. Yeah, spot on. So spot on. I had no idea what you were talking about. Uh, <laughs> you got to read up on your American myths, Aaron. I do. Sorry, I've got plenty of time to do that. I don't see why I'm not doing it. That's fair. Um, I would say uh, what I've what I have realized though is that with longer hair the threshold of how much I can grow out my beard before I start to look like I crawled out of a sewer somewhere <laughs> is getting lower. I have to keep my beard trimmed or else it's going to look real crazy, man. Like my, my dad will come out <laughs> from the other room and be like, who invited this person in here? He'll throw me into the lake. I don't want to join no cult. <laughs> <laughs> I don't watch what you're selling. <laughs> Yeah, your beard, uh, your beard hair combination is getting epic. Like you had some epic beards back in college, but this is a, uh, like I don't know, the hair and beard beard like combo is, is 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 on a new level. The webcam <laughs> doesn't do it justice. It is shocking. <laughs> <laughs> you uh, do look like an extra in a Bible movie. One hundred percent. That's right. Yeah, of the somebody in the background. Like, but like a a. Bible movie produced by a Christian studio, not like a <laughs> yes. Gods and Kings yes. or a Noah. <laughs> That's right. That's right. A movie where everyone is white. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. Well, that's Hollywood too. I mean, let's be fair. It's <laughs> yeah, it's like valid. Yeah. <laughs> valid point. But what's the number? Otherwise, you're dead to oh, yourself. Yeah, you're right. I'm dead to myself. Otherwise, <laughs> uh, I don't know. I I think it's probably I, mine hasn't gone down too much. I, I'm like a six five. I was a seven last time. Uh, I'm going like slightly more insane, but I've already accepted that I'm insane. And I sort of like try to mitigate that insanity a little bit. So now I have like sort of a half routine where like every lunch I'll run and then the next lunch I'll go hammock outside and then the next lunch I'll run. But I don't lunches? actually Are you taking anything. Day? Yeah. So many lunches. So many lunches. <laughs> 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 yeah, so I alternate every day. I try gotcha. to keep myself a little bit sane. And it's been working to an extent, but not enough to nullify the insanity. So if, you, if you're acknowledging your own insanity, does that – so that would put a ceiling on the amount of insanity. It's a catch-22. Yeah, second, so, so I mean like – Insanity, you're no longer insane. <laughs> uh, yeah, so like you're, you're on the other side of the tracks. So like you're insane, but yeah. you're, not, you're not too deep in. It's like, have you guys read uh, In the Heart of Darkness? Uh, it's, the, it's the book that uh, Apocalypse Now is based on. Are you familiar yeah, with I am. That? I'm familiar with the one, yeah. Yeah, so like they go into the jungles of Africa. So like as soon as they get there, they're technically in Africa. But they go deeper and deeper into the heart of darkness. So it's like while they're in Africa, they're more in Africa the deeper in they go. So like you're, you're in Africa, but you're not like in Africa. Just yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like grazing insanity. Like I'm, I'm just like lightly grazing it. You know what I mean? <laughs> just like to take this time and point out that like when I went to Africa, it was awesome. <laughs> I mean, they're, being me little, too. they're being a little dramatic. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <but>. <laughs> no, I mean Wait, the heart of darkness version. You went to yes, you went to late seventeen, <laughs> early eighteen hundreds colonial Africa, John. I'm I'm unfamiliar with that. We all know, as Americans, if you say the word Africa, you are talking about, like, the boogeyman of all countries that is only a bad, like, only impoverished, even though it's a continent. <laughs> <laughs> There's lots of countries in Africa, believe it or not. Yeah, that's, like, the funniest thing to me. This is a tangent for another time. This is a grind my gears for another time. <laughs> but we're that's just right. always like, oh, you went to Africa? Like, you know, I went and visited my sister. I got... I, when I came back, they were just like, were you saving the world? I was like, no, I was visiting a land with rich cultural heritage and <laughs> exploring this amazing place. Like, it's actually nothing, pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing to help anybody. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, just a sidebar about the cultural diversity in Africa. Did you know Akon bought a country? He has a small <laughs> country that Akon. runs on it, it, Akon. What's it yes. with it? Uh, I mean, they run on his cryptocurrency. That's what their economy runs on. What's it called? So, hold on, I'll get you. I'll get you the name. It's been a couple of months. This is my favorite fact. Acon <laughs> <laughs> and Asheroff. <laughs> so, 
It's uh it's just called Acon City. And I believe <laughs> it's he hasn't had a hit in 10 years, and this dude is buying a right. country. Excuse me. So the name of the city is Akon Crypto City. <laughs> wow. It's built on 2,000 acres of land, and it was given to him by the Senegalese president. Money was a mistake. <laughs> it was given, so he didn't buy it. Uh, he did not buy it, but it runs on his currency. So cryptocurrency was a mistake. <laughs> really going to pay for itself. Yeah. Because he didn't have to pay wow, for it. Wow, we, we really, really took a detour. <laughs> Sidebar. <laughs> Sidebar uh, over. I would love to map that out and see how we got to Akon. <laughs> really hard to say. Really hard to say. Uh, wow. All right. How do you even transition from that? Uh, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> good luck. No. Got my work cut out for me. Um, so our opening segment, you might have heard of it. Um, this is a very popular one. You loved it so much on the last episode, so we're gonna do it again. And this one is called Straight into the Main Topic. Now, let me explain the rules. There are none. We go straight into the main topic. So the only rule is that there are no rules. N- no, that's <laughs> not even a rule. There just are no rules. You so I have a so I have a question. So yeah. are we going to keep track of who wins this opening game episode to episode? And then at the end, the winner wins something. We're going to do that. Like any sort of, we haven't really talked about it, but the winner is whoever goes straight into the main topic. And the reward for winning is going straight into the main topic. Does that answer I have your a follow up question. I feel like you have an unfair advantage. Because you are the one who sends us into the main topic. <laughs> Therefore, it is unfairly weighted. To- Maybe that's intentional. But if the prize is us going straight into the main topic, does it really matter? Yes. No? Uh, let's think about this for five more minutes. Okay. Right. <laughs> Last thing. <laughs> Last thing. Okay. Yep. I say let's go into the main topic. I don't want Thank to go you. into the main topic yet. Now this I want to go not... into the main topic. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Perfect. I'm glad we're all on the same page. We all get a point. Just kidding. There are no points. Here we go. Straight into the main topic. Um, so if you want more nonsense, I recommend listening to our 300th episode that went up this last Monday. Um, we're taking a little bit of a break from opening segments, potentially some email land stuff. We might do email land. We might not depending on the week, but, um, we, we kind of want to take this series. He's just forward. combing his beard as you're trying to talk about. <laughs> what are you, what are you talking about? I'm not combing my beard. That's insane. <laughs> Aaron, please continue. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I'm sorry to all of our audio listeners. There's a video version of this, <laughs> and Sage is combing his beard while I'm saying all of this. Um, you literally have no evidence that that's happening. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. We'll find a way. Um, so, yeah, anyway, we, we sort of uh, started this series last week, and um, it's a little bit more, a little bit of, of a more heavy series. I know last last time I went into a little bit of my own story and some of the things that I was struggling with. I will say, like, just as a quick update to that, um, I'm feeling a little bit better and more rooted, um, at least in at least in the resurrection, which is sort of the linchpin of the whole thing. And and I feel like I can rest in that enough to like continue to to bring these concerns and these questions to Jesus and to recognize that like just because I don't have like just because I have these questions doesn't mean the entire thing is up in the air. You know, it's, it feels like that sometimes, but it's not necessarily the case. So just want to chime in and like throw that in there um, for, for anyone out there who might be wondering how things are. Um, I'm still processing through a lot of it, but, but I think I'm starting to sink back into, I'm starting to see certain things come back down and continue to make sense. So that's been helpful. Um, this week we're going to turn things over to Sage and Sage, I think like last time we talked to you, you mentioned you were going to be going into a little bit, uh, about deconstruction in the context of your education. So you've, you majored in philosophy as a undergrad degree and, um, you got your 
MDiv from Wake and, and interested in hearing, um, interested in hearing some about your, a little bit of your experience with that, you know, um, and just kind of hearing where you come from on the whole topic of deconstruction and some of the struggles that you faced going through all of that. And yeah, I don't know. This is just, this is a series where we're just kind of getting vulnerable and being honest and, and, you know, um, sort of formatting it the same as last time. Um, yeah, John, if you and I think of any questions, let's, let's jot them down and we'll make it a conversation. And, and yeah, um, I guess I'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Sage. Let's, uh, let's hear it. How, how have you been processing this topic? So uh, it brought me back to some uh, interesting conversations I used to have with myself in my dorm room after class. Uh, but I guess I should probably back up a little bit. So um, I, like John especially, and Aaron most of the time, because you you know moved around a decent bit uh, growing up, but we come from a pretty incredibly conservative area. Uh, and especially like, you know, I come from the Southern Baptist church. So there's like very strict understandings of virtually everything. You know, there's uh, in the church I grew up in, there wasn't a ton of room for uh, dissent necessarily, uh, you know, differing views really on much of anything. Um, so I came in to college with a very strict understanding of, uh, you know, inerrancy. There's nothing wrong anywhere in the Bible, you know, sort of all of that. So like, that's the background I come from. And then I go to ETSU, uh, East Tennessee State University, otherwise known as the Harvard of the South. Um, yeah. Yes. <laughs> it is. It is an Ivy League for sure. Like, yes. Yeah. There's there is in fact ivy growing on a couple of those brick buildings. I can, I can <laughs> definitely most of it's that. poison ivy. So yes, <laughs> almost all it. of it's almost all of it's poison ivy. Don't, don't touch. It. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I had no idea what I wanted to do uh, at first. My dream was to be a, a a broadcaster for ESPN. Like that was the dream, and then at some point I realized that I'd have to cover baseball in Iowa. Uh, and I was like, okay, it sounds like a terrible idea. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was out on that pretty fast. The problem is I had declared the major of, uh, I don't know, mass comm, I think it was. Uh, so I ended up just trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I talked about this before. Uh, when I was 18, the pastor at my church announced that he had cancer. And I sat in the front row, not knowing what to do. I was just totally shell shocked. And I asked myself the question, uh, who will teach us now? And I heard an audible voice say, you will. And I was terrified by that. And I actively ran away from that and tried to stay out of any sort of leadership, uh, you know, student leadership or anything in churches. Uh, and, you know, that's the struggle of me knowing that in some way that's what I'm supposed to do and me not wanting to do that uh, has been a pretty present struggle in my life uh, basically the whole way uh, since then. So like 18 up to 26. So like that entire time has been, you know, sort of a back and forth struggle with that. Uh, so given that I know that in some way I'm supposed to teach, I don't know what that's going to look like. Uh, Based on my background, the only way I understand that is being uh, the only pastor at a small church, you know, and that just sounds terrifying to me that I have to prepare 52 sermons a year, you know, all this. So, you know, I have this idea that I'm supposed to minister in some way, but also I don't want to at all. So that's where we're at. And I sort of forced myself into moving towards that in a small way. So I was looking at majors and I saw uh, a major in philosophy with a concentration in religious studies, which I heard, uh, you know, at like regular state secular universities, whatever you want to call them. Uh, that tends to be the route people go if they're going to seminary or divinity school. Um, so I did that and then uh, started as a philosophy major my second semester. Uh, and then uh, I was not prepared for what came next. Uh, so there were a few different uh, sort of classes that I went through that really challenged me. Uh, so the regular philosophy classes, you know, they 
weren't too difficult or anything or too pressing. The problem sort of came with my first like scripture classes. So at about the, actually at the same time, I took a Hebrew scriptures class. So Old Testament class and uh, a class called historical Jesus. So these, like I said, not prepared for this at all. Uh, basically what happens is I go through the old Testament class and, uh, if, you know, I just immediately find out, you know, like based on, uh, sort of textual criticism and, you know, study and all this that, you know, there are two creation narratives in Genesis, you know, all, all of these things that you run into that you're like, wait, what? Uh, you know, they're within the Pentateuch. So the first five books of the old Testament, there are at least four primary sources that appear to uh, disagree on certain things. Like one of the sources happens to be pro-monarchy uh, and another source is very anti-monarchy. And you see that happening within the text. So this is all stuff I'm not prepared for at all because as I understood, uh, God wrote the Bible. Uh, I had basically no frame of reference for who wrote anything in the Old Testament. Uh, I had no understanding of, you know, the Bible as any sort of collection of books. It was all one thing together. So with specifically the Old Testament class, uh, it was, it just uh, sort of really challenged my view of the Bible as uh, one cohesive story. Uh, you know, I mean, so that was, that was very tough for me to handle. Uh, and then of course that on this side, so like the textual criticism stuff, also looking at, you know, Joshua, I mean, let's be real, the, you know, the cleansing quote unquote of the Holy land, you know, like it's, that's hard to read and see the, you know, the mercy and grace of the God who died for our sins in, you know, telling, telling Joshua and the Hebrews to, you know, kill women and children, uh, you know, all these things. So like, I'm just sort of hit with this and I don't know what to do with it. And I have, I don't know anyone I can ask about this. So I'm just sort of left to work through that on my own. So that's the old Testament. Um, and I think, it came to a point where I had to ask myself the question, like, what, what can I give up and still be a Christian? So I had, I had to, I, it was deconstruction at a very literal theological level. It was like, okay, what can I boil this down to? If I can't look at, you know, Job as being literal, we've had this conversation a million times. Mm -hmm. If I can't look at Job as being literal based on, you know, what I've learned about it, what does that mean? Because as I understand the Bible, and as so many people who come from where we come from understand the Bible, if one line of Job is wrong, then that means the rest of it might also be wrong. So it's so understanding the Bible in that way as one thing that's not separate, and we can't look, you know, we can't sort of look at context, and we can't look at, uh, you know, each book as its own thing from its own place, all of these things. So with that viewpoint, I was pretty close to broken. Mm. Uh, so I had to just say, you know, what, what if I have to just put the New Testament down, you know, do the Andy Stanley thing where he, you know, basically has been like, you know, we don't really need it. And, you know, that's something I wrestled with. And to some degree, I, I still do. I have I've sort of come to a place with that. Uh, but that's something I had to really think about. Um, so that's, that's just the old Testament class. So like I said, at the same time, something that for me was even more challenging was the historical Jesus class. Uh, and so the professor, so let me just say right now, the professor was a, an, a, an incredible teacher, a great guy. He was the head of, head of the history department at the time. Uh, tremendous, tremendous smart guy, but we clearly disagreed theologically. So let me just, let me just say that at the outset. Um, I mean, it was, 
it seemed to be that one of the the points of the class was to in a way demythologize Jesus. And I think it's important to put it that way because that's people who don't see Jesus as God see what we do as mythology. I mean, that's just the way it is. Like God is Zeus and Jesus is Hercules, you know, something along those lines. Like that's, that's what, you know, they imagine this as being. So I was introduced to this thing called uh, syncretism. So this is a uh, historical religious theory, which is basically, uh, so you have, you know, especially in like Alexander's uh, empire, uh, the Hellenistic empire of the Greeks. So you have Alexander who goes and conquers a new city. The new city has a God. Uh, he learns about this God, you know, uh, the, the example in class when he was explaining it was like Bob. So the, this God's name is Bob of this city. Uh, and then Alexander's like, Oh, actually I, I, I know Bob in our religion. His name is Jim. And they're like, Oh, okay. So Bob and Jim are the same thing. And then it's just sort of like melding of religions. And, uh, you know, you do see this in uh, sort of like the mystery cults, if you're familiar with those. There's the cult of Addis, the cult of uh, Isis and Osiris. The, uh, uh, these are all like ancient uh, mystery religions. Um, and even the concept of like a mystery religion, it's this idea that in a way, almost sounds a bit like how Christianity works. It's like there are these great secrets to be known uh, related to the story of this God. And in order to know the secrets, you have to be inducted into the group. And, you know, there's a quote unquote baptism ritual, you know, all these things where it seems like, oh, that actually sounds a lot like, you know, like the stuff we do, you know, broad strokes. Uh, so it's like all of this where it's like demythologizing Jesus and being like, hey, all that stuff, uh, you know, Jesus story about uh, Herod killing, the, you know, everybody under two years old. So I got the same thing as Moses. And it's like, oh, in the Osiris story, he was actually put in a basket and shipped down the, you know, the river or whatever. And it's like, oh, OK, so how we're supposed to come away from this is that, oh, so all of the amazing things about Jesus are taken from somewhere else. So this is a story cobbled together by, you know, maybe the apostles, maybe somebody else who claimed to know the apostles, uh, if they even existed. Uh, you know, so there's all this. So it's basically like, you know, another example is uh, Jesus as the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, uh, the Son of God. So the idea is uh, Augustus Caesar. So he is the adopted heir of the legendary Roman general Julius Caesar. So after Julius Caesar's death, he is venerated as a god. So they basically think of him as a god from then on. And this is important because Augustus Caesar can now say that I am the son of the, I am a son of the god. So he's the son of God, which, you know, makes him powerful and important and everything. Uh, you know, Caesar is the lord of lords, which means the greatest of all lords in the world. The king of kings is the greatest of all kings. So all of these things we think of as uh, specific to Jesus aren't is is what is what I'm being taught throughout this whole thing so you know these are conversations that I have to go and talk about on my own or with Jamie because I don't feel comfortable going to anybody else with this uh, so I'm just I'm totally lost I don't know what I can actually believe I'm still going to the well uh, you know I'm still uh, going to you know my small group uh, you know, everything. And I want to believe, but I'm struggling at this point to know. So first of all, what do I do with the Bible? And second of all, what do I do with Jesus? Because it started out as sort of, you know, even if I don't know what to do with the Bible, I can feel confident about Jesus. But then, you know, that's being sort of deconstructed as well. So I don't know what to do with any of it. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's like, I think that's all of the deconstruction and I'll talk about like my answers to that and my like just like working through it and wrestling with that. So that's everything at ETSU. I'll talk about how I address that. Do you all have any how did questions that, or yeah. Yeah. I mean, how did that feel? Uh, 
to be going through all that and to not feel like you really had anyone who could sort of speak to that stuff. Yeah. I mean, it's exactly how I described it when we were talking on your episode, which was like, I am in a river where the current is too strong. I can't swim out and I'm just being carried and I'm looking for anything to grab onto. I'm looking for a rock jutting out of the water. I'm looking for a tree branch to grab onto. I'm looking for somebody to throw me something like, Mm -hmm. I'm just totally, totally lost. And I, I don't know what to hitch myself to, you know, I'm, I'm clinging on, but it feels like I'm standing on quicksand, you know, and it feels like I'm sinking. So, I mean, it was, it's, it's, it's pretty difficult to describe. Uh, I think the river analogy is probably the best that I'd be able to do, but if you've been through it, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Like, Mm -hmm. that's what it feels like. There's, for you, when you're going through this time, what would have been like your dream scenario to have to be supported? Like, like what would have, what would it, if you could have walked into any room and any resource or any person would have been available, like what would that have looked like for you to be going through this and feel supported in this? Mm-hmm. So I think the most the one that would have helped the most would have been someone who actually knew the old Testament, who was a Christian, like being there with me, someone who wasn't afraid of the questions. So so if I was like, what do you think of this J E P D source thing? Like, what do you, what do you do with source criticism? You know, because I I couldn't go to the pastor at my church and talk about source criticism. You know, they wouldn't have known, you know, what that was. They'd be like, Oh, the German thing. (laughs) <laughs> so i mean just somebody who somebody who knew what i was going through and not not in a sense of me being able to tell them but who had gone through it themselves who was at least educated on the stuff i was hearing about because this was all the first time i had heard right. any of this so i got a, two questions off that one question one why don't you why we have an institution in a church an american church where people go once a week you know how come we don't teach people this stuff? Or if, even if you throw all this stuff out and think that all of this is, is incorrect, like how come we don't warn people about this stuff? And two, how come, we, how come we don't have those resources, just somebody to talk to? That's not asking for the moon and the stars. You know, you're just like, you know, it'd be nice if I could have had a conversation <laughs> with somebody. Yeah. Someone who understood the Old Testament right. I could talk to would be helpful. Yeah. And so in your opinion, why do you think that we are so bad at providing any kind of help during this time? I mean, so I can't, I can't speak to that for every church or say that that's just like a, you know, church-wide thing, but at least in the kind of church that I come from, you know, the rural uh, more conservative church. Uh, so, I mean, if like, if you don't know that stuff, how can you talk about that stuff? Yeah. Because all you can say is that's wrong. Yeah. Mm. So, th- I mean, that's not going to be helpful. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then sort of the, the next level of that is, I don't know. And we've talked about this before. I don't know how much open questioning and sort of like a Q and a type of culture is accepted or, you know, wanted in, yeah. in a lot of churches. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, when, when I am trying to struggle with like, you know, like I think Jonah's a satire and, you know, not a literal thing. So yeah. like when I'm going through that, I, my feeling within me is there's a problem with my theology, not here's a question to ask. It's there's something wrong with me. I need to fix my faith so that I believe this correctly. And then I won't need to ask anybody about it because I've, Mm. I've got the right point of view. So Mm. it's like for a lot of people, there's a culture of questions are bad and that's bad when people have questions. <laughs> so it's, it's like questions are bad in part because they imply questioning or doubt. But also, like, I think there's something about people not wanting to not have the answer to questions because that can, you know, 
make them question and be like, oh, I don't have the answer to this. Maybe they're right. Maybe I'm wrong. You know, all this stuff. Uh, but also, like, there's a bit of a, a lack of control, I think, in, uh, in some, and this isn't for everyone, of course, but I mean, in some churches, you know, with a more authoritarian leadership structure, mm-hmm. asking questions and not, you know, just sort of falling in line is bad. And it means there's a lack of control. So like, you got to get out of there kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I mean, I think for a million different reasons, there's just a culture of thinking of questioning as bad or like a season, a season that is negative as opposed to a part of the faith journey. And sometimes there's even lip service paid to questions are good, you know, strengthens your faith in the end. But questioning isn't necessarily a positive experience if no one's helping you through that and trying to walk you through that. And, Mm. you know, even if they don't have answers, you know, giving you resources to look at or, you know, even saying, yeah, I don't know either. You Mm. know, like, it's like, that's the scariest thing for so many people is, being able to not have the answer and say, I don't know. Mm. Okay. So, you know, that's, so that's like every, that's theologically the hardest time in my entire life Mm. is going through this. So like, not sure what to do with Jesus. Uh, to feel more, more positive kind of, uh, <laughs> cause at least in my opinion, it seems like, uh, scholarship of the new Testament was like less jarring for me, mm-hmm. uh, just cause it's closer to time. We have copies on copies on copies to, you know, show that, okay, this is, you know, even like the, the, like people who are like, ah, oh, we have no idea if this, you know, is what the originals wrote. And it's like their estimates, like, at best it's 95% accurate. To, <laughs> it's like, Oh, okay. So we're, we're yeah. probably good. I think, I think we're good there. So yeah. like in terms of like how I felt about the new Testament, there was never any huge attack there. It was ma- it was mainly on like Jesus, which of course is the thing. So like, <laughs> that's, that's kind of a big, big deal. deal. Uh, yeah. So, you know, like I came to the point where I was like, I don't know what to do with the old Testament. I have no idea what to do with this. I don't know if I need it. Like it was hard for me to even read it for a while. Just, I had no clue what to do with it. I didn't know how to make sense of it. I didn't know where it fit into any, you know, sort of understanding. You know, I I came to the point where I was like, okay, um, can't understand Jesus as the Messiah without the old Testament. Like that was, there was, there's a point. That's the most positive thing I could come up with. Uh, And then specifically with Jesus is like everything got pushed back and it seemed like everything was up in the air. So I just had to sit down with myself and say like, what is the one thing that I can fall back on? It was very much like the idea of whatever Descartes was going for was like, if I just boil all this down, where can I start of like a thing that I can, (laughs) can be a foundation (laughs) to start from. So I was thinking and I, I, you know, I heard, uh, I heard an apologist uh, talk about the, he was asked the question, how can I be certain of the historical accuracy of the resurrection? And he said, so, you know, what we have is this group of, uh, this group of apostles. So what happens with them is, they see a historical event and this takes them from being fishermen and tax collectors and like blue collar, you know, regular, you know, regular super poor people in the, you know, the backwater of the Roman empire for all intents and purposes. So like these guys see something that changes everything about their lives and they become like, some of the most key intellectuals in the history of like (laughs) our world. Uh, So like, and what's important here is like you can be seduced into an ideology or like a cult following a charismatic leader, you know, whatever. And, 
you know, you can believe all sorts of things based on, you know, like the ideology that, you know, is so like the ideology can get you to do things or believe things or whatever. So they were very not in a good place when Jesus was dead. They were like, well, looks like that's pretty much it. That's, that's a shame. Yeah. And then something happened and then they changed the entire face of human history <laughs> and they wrote the best selling book of all time. <laughs> uh, so like, and the main thing is not just that it's also almost every single one of them died awful, terrible deaths when those deaths could have been avoided simply by saying, okay, it didn't happen. Any one of them could have done it. And if they did do it, we would have heard about it. We'd still <laughs> yeah. hear about it. Yeah. Uh, if they had done it, there wouldn't be, there wouldn't be Christianity right now. Like it wouldn't exist as a world religion because it would have been false. Mm -hmm. So, you know, John boiled in oil and, you know, exiled to a, a desert island. Mm -hmm. He didn't say, no, it didn't actually happen. Peter was crucified upside down. Didn't say that. And then, so Paul happened too. Mm -hmm. So like, first one is like the apostles. <laughs> so like the thing that changed them was something they claimed to have seen that made them get to the point where they were like, kill us. <laughs> <laughs> we saw it that's what happened we will die telling the entire world what we saw it's like okay that's pretty good that's, that's a pretty good piece of argument and then paul so imagine uh for people who know philosophy or like are familiar with like the new atheist movement richard dawkins is like the head honcho of atheists who hate christianity and think it's bad uh, he's also a eugenicist, so he's a terrible person. Uh, <laughs> just throw that out there. Uh, so, ima so imagine if Richard Dawkins was like riding a horse going to another town, and he fell off the horse and got up, changed his name to like Pritchard Dawkins, I guess. <laughs> 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 I guess, I guess that's the analogy uh, for using uh, modern American English. Uh, so if he changed his name and then became the ultimate cheerleader for Christianity for the rest of his life and also became one of those guys like, yeah, you cut my head off if you want. <laughs> Jesus kicked me off a horse. Now I'm, uh, now I'm a Christian. So let's go. So like, <laughs> as far like if I broke it down to the like lowest possible level, is like those two things were something I was like, okay. What took I, you to getting that to that point, I guess, is my question. Cause you went through these years at ETSC where it was yeah. a real big struggle, but mm -hmm. I guess what ultimately caused you to land on that? If you don't mind me asking. I mean, so that those are like conversations I had with myself and with Jamie. And then also, like I said, I watched uh, this apologist work through that. And I was like, yeah, yes. Because, I mean, any other thing where people are, like, having suicide packs or, you know, whatever is, like, they've been indoctrinated into this, like, community or ideology, and, you know, they're, like, total believers, and that's why they do it. Whereas, like, in this case, I mean, you have people who were, like, well, this sucks. I guess, I guess I'll go back to – I guess I'll go fish again. Go fishing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then they were, like – and then Jesus was on the shore and then I swam to him and then we ate fish together. And then, uh, here I am, kill me Roman empire. <laughs> you know, like, so like just hitting that moment, like realizing that. And then also the thing with Paul, I was like, okay, so that's my floor is mm. I completely believe like Jesus died and was resurrected. So like, I was like, okay, worst case scenario, that's, that's pretty good. <laughs> I feel like uh, I feel like that's something I can build a Christian faith on. <laughs> so, so like, so that's where I'm at at that point. Is okay, Jesus sounds good. And then I do, uh, you know, I take a Greek scriptures class as well. And like I said, the arguments, I was just like, nah, these aren't these aren't great. I mean, what are they that Paul and James disagreed about faith and works. And, you know, I'm not 
convinced on that. I think we've talked about it before. I think they were fighting different enemies. I think Paul was talking to people who were a little too religious. And I think James was talking to people who weren't religious enough. Yeah. So, you know, like, so, so that's where I'm at. You know, I feel really good about the new Testament. I'm confident in the resurrection. Uh, and then I, I do some, uh, more research on syncretism and I think what I'm going to do I'm pretty sure I still have a file of it I think I'm going to drop it as a blog so that it's like on our website um, mm. so I'm doing research into syncretism and it's like man I, I can't believe how all of this like maps on to Christianity so well and Could then I start what syncretism is just for the listener yeah so specifically with like the mystery religions so they're like in my, the paper I wrote is like my uh, final paper for the class. Um, so you've got three uh, mystery religions. So you have one that's the cult of Mithra. Uh, you have one that's the cult of Sybil and Attis. And then you have the cult of uh, Isis and Osiris. So you have these three deals and it's like, you know, they're supposed to be very reminiscent of Jesus. And then the idea, like I was sort of talking about earlier, is like the way it works is there's like a baptism deal, you know, like the God dies and rises again, you know, uh, you join and then you get all this mystery knowledge. And I was like, okay, so that sounds a little bit like Christianity. And then as I do research, and like I said, I'll, we'll, we'll put up the paper, I think, in the next uh, couple of weeks. So I find out that the reason a lot of this stuff maps so well is because of like early church fathers. So what they did was they went and most of the sources we have about these mystery religions were made by like, uh, I think Justin Martyr was one of them. Uh, Justinian uh, is another. So like they went in and they studied these religions and they basically like made the comparisons more like overt in order to say that they're bad and made by the devil. So I was like, oh, that's, that's pretty interesting. So I looked at, the, at these myself. Uh, so in the cult of Mithra, do you know what their baptism ritual is? Not familiar. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I realize how ridiculous the question is. Uh, so you stand in a hole and they walk a bull over you on like a platform with like, uh, like there's like holes in the platform. And they kill the bull over you and you're baptized in its blood. I was like, yeah, that seems to be exactly what Christian baptism is. <laughs> so, so, I mean, there's that. The other thing is uh, the, the dying and rising thing is hilarious. Like, it's hilarious. so funny. Uh, so with Osiris, he was uh, cut up into pieces this and is then the his favorite one, by the way. Oh, it's amazing. It's story. amazing. It's amazing. And then his body parts are spread all over the world. And then Isis, who is both his sister and his wife, uh, goes to put him back together. And then there's there's some other stuff. There's some like uh, <laughs> Yeah, I was waiting gold. to see how, how you would yeah. explain this one. <laughs> yeah, so Isis is looking for one part that seems important uh, to life. Let's just say that. Uh, Pivotal so in she, the baby making process. <laughs> correct. Uh, so she makes one out of gold. She stitches him back together and somehow like has a baby with him. Uh, and then he's like put in a coffin and then the coffin's put in the water. Uh, so he's dead and then he goes to the underworld because he's dead and then he becomes the ruler of the underworld. So if that's not resurrection after <laughs> dying, I don't <laughs> know what else is. Uh, but that's actually not even my favorite, John. Really? Uh, so the cult of Sybil and Addis. So it's like this love story and uh, Addis ends up uh, castrating himself and mm. then bleeding out a tree grows from the blood in the ground and that's resurrection. Oh, okay. Got you. So it's like, okay, maybe, <laughs> maybe the parallels are not like actually accurate to like what Christianity is. Mm -hmm. Like this is very, like if you just look at them, it's, it's pretty strange. Like this is, this is not for real. And then the biggest one of course is just the idea of a mystery religion is we have these secrets. You have to come join and then you're in. 
And it's like, Christianity's like, you go and tell all the secrets. <laughs> <laughs> and then people decide after hearing all of the secrets <laughs> if they want to join or not. <laughs> so just breaking it down is like, that's the, it's stupid. Like the only reason we're having this conversation is because like a couple of, uh, you know, early church fathers were like, maybe they saw it. Maybe like, maybe it was just a, like a polemical tool to get people out of these mystery religions, bring them into Christianity, who knows, but like the parallels are crap. Like they're not, <laughs> they're not accurate. Like they both don't like respect Christianity enough and they don't even really respect the mystery religions enough. Like they're extrapolating and, you know, making something resurrection when it's not, or, you know, whatever. So all of that was sort of torn down and I was like, okay, so I can feel confident about like who Jesus is and that it's not just us doing mythology. Uh, so like, that's where I'm at with Jesus and the new Testament. So I feel really confident there. And then the old Testament is where it gets tricky. So, mm -hmm. so I'm not, uh, you know, however, wherever you're at on the infallible uh, inerrant conversation, I am the one that thinks everything in scripture is there so that we can know Jesus and be saved. So that, that's where I'm at. Hmm. Uh, the old Testament, you know, I do think like source criticism, like it, it's hard not to see source criticism at work after you've read it. You know, like it's very clearly, you know, like been worked on by multiple editors. Does that mean there's no value in it? Does that mean it's not telling of truth? Does that mean it's not telling an accurate story of the people of Israel, the Jews, you know, throughout time? No, that, that doesn't mean that at all. Um, you know, I think Joan is satire. I think Job is an epic poem. You know, there are all sorts of these things where I'm at. It's like, okay, that's where I'm at. And I had to set aside the idea of this sort of like concrete, the Bible is this. Hmm. So, you know, I understand that the Old Testament is written in this time period and the New Testament is all written, you know, like from approximately, you know, at the earliest, like 55 AD to at the latest 120 AD. So the whole New Testament is written in that time period. Whereas, you know, the Old Testament is, you know, written by a ton, ton of different people, you know, some in the Northern Kingdom, some in the Southern Kingdom, uh, some post-exile, some pre-exile. Like, there are all sorts of factors and things that are happening there. Um, so, like, you know, that, that I'm, I'm still working through, but at least for me, and I understand some people are going to hear this and be like, well, I guess he's not a Christian anymore like based <laughs> on where I'm at with the old Testament. But I mean, that's, that's where I'm at is, you know, the, the thing I came back to, as I said earlier, was we can't really understand who Jesus is unless we know the old Testament, whether we, you know, agree with, you know, we're wondering if first Kings and first Chronicles line up perfectly, you know, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, we can have a, a, a deeper, you know, more analytical conversation about that another time, maybe, but I'll have to read up on that first, of course. Uh, <laughs> but just like all of that is, is secondary to me. So like all of the themes of sin, like fall, grace, redemption, salvation, everything like I said, everything that we need to understand who Jesus is and what he means is in the old Testament. So like without it, what's a Messiah? None of that makes any sense. Why was he born in Bethlehem? Why, you know, X, Y, Z, like none of that makes any sense, mm -hmm. but to have a, like the fullest understanding of Jesus we can possibly have on this earth is to know the old Testament and to understand it. Hmm. So, you know, that's ultimately where I'm at. It's kind of funny. So at wake, uh, I took an old Testament class, literally had already heard every argument. So like, yeah. no, no problems at all. <laughs> like it was already stuff. I'm like, yeah. Whereas yeah. like other people who were, you know, equally theologically traditional or, you know, maybe a little more liberal, but who weren't, 
up to date were like, <gasps> you know, like <laughs> they were, they were dying. Whereas I was like, yeah, I mean, I've heard this before. You know, I understand how this works. And, okay. That's fine. So wake, wake wasn't theologically difficult. Wake was, so it, uh, let me, let me, t- let me go back. So it wasn't theologically difficult in the sense of me rethinking my theology it was difficult in like knowing that there's a like a completely different christology within you know within the church within the global church that i just can't agree with and i think if i went that far i would have no reason to continue to be a christian yeah you know, this idea that, so Jesus wasn't literally resurrected. So like, that's a non-starter. Uh, <laughs> so if, uh, Paul said, if Jesus didn't, li- if he was, if he didn't rise from the dead, we are to be the most pitied of people in the world. So, you know, I, I like Paul. Uh, it turns out a lot of people don't like Paul. Uh, fun fact. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, that, that's what was challenging about it, was hearing that day in and day out for three years and knowing where I stood, but still having to hear it so many times. And I, I told John, you know, just a sort of funny sidebar thing that happened, uh, John like this. Uh, so it was in my ethics class and it was one of the first couple of days and we were looking at like famous Christian ethicists uh, throughout you know, American history, you know, in the 1900s. And we were looking at like two uh, older uh, people. So they ended up living into their 80s and 90s. And they had these very like social justice oriented, like sort of demythologizing Jesus looks at, you know, what being a Christian means and what it means to live an ethical Christian life. And then we talked about Dietrich Bonhoeffer. (laughs) And no one knew who he was yeah (laughs) Yeah. no one and i like in the background like i I fist pumped in the back of the room i was like let's do this i've been waiting on this all day (laughs) Uh, and uh, so he had this quote and you know it was from his book ethics uh that he never got to finish uh because the nazis killed him Hmm. uh don't you hate that (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That's, hate, it. hate it when you get killed by the Nazis. <laughs> it's a, it's a real bummer. Uh, yeah. But so he had this quote and it broke down his ethics into the most simple thing, which is like, like it starts with Jesus as the real, real. So like Jesus as the logos, Jesus as the, like, like the, the, th- the logical thread that stitches together the atoms in the universe. So like all that stuff from Colossians about Jesus keeping the universe together. So like that's where his ethics come from is believing that about Jesus. And like, that's what reality is. So this is how we act. And somebody in class was like, yeah, I get the, I get the Jesus stuff, but like, what does that really look like? And then the professor straight faced was like, uh, uh, fighting against uh, a brutal fascist authoritarian dictatorship uh, to the point where they kill you. <laughs> no smile. <laughs> no smile. And it was not lost on me that, you know, as great of scholars and writers as the other two people were, they got to live into their 80s and 90s. <laughs> and Dietrich Bonhoeffer was like, what, 39? Like maybe yeah. early 40s? So, like, so that kind of stuff was both tough, but as I've said before, I had uh, Chris and James uh, at Ronaldo uh, shepherding me through this. Uh, I was looking for a church to, uh, you know, we had to do an internship and I found them and, you know, they're ultimately how we got plugged in and how this podcast like is now before you, you know, like uh, it's, it's John's idea and they gave us a platform. So mm-hmm. like, and this is this is how you're hearing us now. This is how it, it got to happen was me running into them. And I just know that uh, there's no telling where I would have ended up theologically or, you know, mm-hmm. what kind of person I would have been coming out of that without them. But God put them in my life at like at an 
at the perfect time. And they were there to be that person I wanted at ETSU, the person who had been there. They had both gotten their MDivs at Wake. James had graduated the year before I got there. And Chris had gone there, I think, right around the time they opened the Divinity School at Wake in the, in the like late 90s, I think. Mm. Uh, so I, I had what I needed. It was tough, mm. and I had to come home and tell Jamie what mm. I heard or you know, talk to John and Aaron about the craziness I had just listened to. But well, you so know, Let me ask a question on that because mm-hmm. I'm, I'm fascinated. Because first off, let me just say, like I told you this, you know, I made it a semester in seminary and then texted you and I was just like, I can't, I can't do this anymore. Like I can't, like I'm, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna explode. Um, because of what you're talking about, about like, for me, it was the domestication of camels in Genesis. That was like the straw that just like <laughs> broke it all. It was yeah. like Genesis can't be true because camels weren't domesticated that early. Mm-hmm. And we're just like, what, what are we, <laughs> what yeah. are we doing? <laughs> like, um, so first, like, props like because you made it for you you know you made it through the MDiv and that yeah um but how did how did that change you how did you know because you talked about the deconstruction through ETSU right and then you go into a setting where you're being taught as fact I mean I don't want to say it may be taught as fact the um that the domestication of camels proves that Genesis was not did was not accurate right like you know so my own i've talked about this before my own personal experience was i was just kind of like oh this is nice this is the counter argument and it's not true you know so this is wonderful Mm -hmm. um for you going through it way longer and at a much higher level than than i did um um how did that change you like did it did it change you did it strengthen you did it discourage you did it encourage you does it change the way that you now go about you know your faith and ministry like how how did that affect you so i think it was helpful for me in having my like vision of the old testament deconstructed first before i went yeah uh because i think it could have probably been really harmful to me for that to have been the first time where I'm also like getting all that and I'm dealing with that at the same time where I'm hearing this like new Christology. So it's like technically Christian, but also like, you know, sort of in my view of what Christianity is like, I I just wouldn't have any reason to be like, I'd just be a, you know, a secular humanist who's nice to people because I'd like them to be nice to me, you know, whatever. Right. So I think that was the most helpful thing going through this was like having it happen first when I am in this like really good community with you all and everybody at the well where I like feeling the love of God, like in relationships with people around me. Whereas like at wake, you know, Jamie and I are away from everybody, you know, like none of our family members were around here or were around down there. You know, she knew one person who had, you know, been in her, uh, you know, program like two years ahead. So like we had no, it's like security blanket. Like we had nobody to go to until I, you know, meet Chris and James. So, you know, like I said, so that was, that like took apart how I viewed the old Testament and I sort of had to cobble it back together and come up with some sort of, uh, you know, coherent narrative. And ultimately, you know, what I came to is, all of the themes that explain Jesus and explain what he means in the world and what being the Messiah is come from the old Testament. So I'm like, okay. And those questions about, you know, like, Oh, well, in, uh, you know, in first Samuel, it says uh, Saul became King when he was one year old in uh, you know, in a, in a very high profile, like uh, document version of it, you know, from a long time ago. So it's like, you know, okay, well, I guess the Bible's not real, you know, or whatever. Uh, so, like, that stuff doesn't bother me. Like, I just, I accept that there might be some truth to it, and there might not be, just because I know people have made those arguments, and I know some people are genuinely convinced by them, and they come from a, you know, a place of actually studying the text and saying, this from Chronicles doesn't line up with this from Kings based on, you know, it's like, okay, that's, that's a conversation. But I've also been in a room where 
a pastor said, Paul, you told Timothy that he could drink a little wine with dinner, and then you also told us not to be drunk. Well, which one is it? So I understand <laughs> that there are a decent number of people who are there, which is like looking for and creating these situations in the text to say that it's, you know, we can't trust it or, you know, it's not whatever. Um, so like I'm, I'm very open handed with a lot of the old Testament to put it frankly. Yeah. And ETSU prepared me for that. So when I heard, you know, whatever new arguments, I don't really think I heard any, you know, about the old Testament going into wake. I was, I was prepared for it. And I'm like, okay, yeah, sure. Why not? Can I ask you a question, Sage? What, to what extent did it feel like your understanding of the Bible was tied to whether you had faith at all? Because I think the place where I was in, which was a really scary place and still sometimes lean in that direction is, <laughs> oh no, like I'm coming to these realizations about how the Bible was pieced together and it feels almost like, like what, what can I believe, you know? And yeah. so like, I guess how quickly did you jump there? And like, I don't know, like, how did you kind of work through that? Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, I talked a, a little bit about that in terms of like, I had to come back to the, the only thing I could go with is like the, what the apostles did and what Paul did. Like mm -hmm. that's where it came down to. And for that reason, I can say, okay, resurrection, you know, so like, um, so that's sort of where I fell, but in terms of how I viewed it, so it's like, you know, like if I believe Job is, uh, an epic poem, like what else is wrong? So there was this, uh, Christian TV show that I used to watch and it, 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 it has a little bit of propaganda in it. Let's just be real. So like they had this chart and it was like two like kingdoms set up next to each other. And one was like, uh, you know, like the believer's life and one is the world. And it's like these two like kingdoms that have like, you know, the world has like a cannon and they're, you know, like they're, they're shooting it at the foundation of this kingdom, which is like, it's like the word of God is the foundation is what it says. So like they're shooting at this and then there's like these other like things, it's basically like some sort of a, like diversion that they're getting the church to focus on or whatever, like social justice issues or, you know, whatever this is like abortion. Like you're talking about all this stuff and the church is worried about all this stuff up here. You know, like all of the warriors in the, the kingdom of God are worried about all this stuff. Whereas like right underneath them, the foundation, the word of God is being deconstructed. And once that goes out, you know, like the kingdom is destroyed and the walls crumble down and, you know, like, and I think that's like a decent understanding of how a lot of Christians understand the Bible. So if there's any question or, you know, if, you know, like we start with Genesis and we say, okay, there's two, res there's two, uh, you know, creation stories. It's like, uh, well, I guess the foundation just exploded. You know, like the thing I've been taught my whole life is, you know, that you have the creation story and then there's like a poem about the creation story afterwards, something like that. And then it's like, it appears that they're from two different sources written two different ways, you know, like they describe not exactly necessarily the same events in the same order, you know, that sort of thing. So, you know, that's, I mean, that's how I viewed the Bible. And I think how a lot of people still view the Bible is if any of this is wrong, then I have reason to question all of it because that's how we teach the Bible is that every bit of it is correct, completely accurate, infallible, inerrant. Uh, you know, it's 100% accurate to the way it was originally written. You know, all these, all these sorts of things, you know, it was written by one person, you know, Moses wrote the entire Pentateuch. He wrote all five books. Uh, even he, even he, died, he died at the end. <laughs> yeah. Why so stop like, out of five? Like he yeah, wrote the whole thing, right? Yeah. He wrote the whole thing, including the new Testament. I mean, <laughs> I mean, but like, that's not said, but that's like a lot of people have that sort of like understanding of it. Like, that's what we, what we feel without actually, you know, it's, it's almost like a, an inborn theology that's been placed into us is that 
God wrote this. And, you know, you see those like daily show interviews of people in crowds or whatever. And people are asked like, well, who wrote the Bible? And people say like, God wrote the Bible. And like, you'll have quite a few people who will say that. And to some extent that is correct, you know, inspired by God and, you know, it is connected to God's purpose in the world. But like, whether it's because of fear or lack of knowledge on our own part, we have so we so poorly teach what the Bible is and how it's constructed because we're afraid, we're either afraid of what could happen if people know, or if we explore that ourselves, or we don't know on our own. And how, how can that be if we're Christians and the most important source document for our lives is the Bible? How can we possibly be afraid of wanting to know more about how it was put together? Mm-hmm. You know, it's just that that's patently absurd. Mm. If it's like, God is powerful enough to be able to withstand our questions. And I don't think God would be shocked if he found out that Jonah was a satire about prophets. Like he wouldn't stop existing. If he exists right now, he will exist if we have that conversation. (laughs) So, So like, I just think it's, it's a failure of the like, system of the church in teaching the bible to lay people like i think plain and simple like that's what it is we can have you know conferences on conferences to discuss how better to you know teach the bible but i think we can all say it's not a great idea not a great idea to teach it the way we've done it it just sets people up for when they hear this stuff they've never heard it before so they're like well i guess it's wrong i guess everything i've ever known about this faith is wrong right So what would you say, like in that analogy of the, of the foundation and the kingdom on the foundation with everything going around in your mind, what should that foundation be? Jesus. Yes. So it seems like it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny how we've turned it though in our culture, Mm -hmm. exactly what you were saying, where we, we stop using the Bible to let us know more about God. Mm -hmm. You know, we just say like the Bible is God. Mm-hmm. It's like no, it, it's to help us know God better. Yeah, it's it's interesting how we interpret the idea of the Word of God. Meaning, so like, there are many different sort of interpretations of what that could be. So like, God's Word is you know the Gospel. God's Word is the Bible in in some sense at the very least. But if we take this to the like origin, if we go to John chapter one verse one. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So the word is is Jesus. <laughs> so I, I think it's important we start there. And I think this may be like sort of a I don't know, an extrapolation of the uh sola scriptura argument. So, you know, we've we've made the Bible God. And and I think some people would even agree with this is like Jesus is the Bible made flesh is like an actual teaching in the church. And I, I, I don't think that that's exactly the case. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. It's just crazy to think that like these conversations don't happen in churches. You know, it's really sad. <laughs> I mean, at least, and we should preface that with, in our experience. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, these conversations. There, there are churches like, uh, you know, Aaron's church in Colorado where they have conversations like this mm-hmm. and it's great. And it's helpful because it's set in a place where you're going to hear these arguments from like regular people because regular people, you know, might be more generally educated about the Bible than, you know, regular people who aren't Christians, you know, which are, you know, a bit few, fewer and f- more, you know, farther between, right. Uh, you know, down in the South or in the Bible belt somewhere. Mm-hmm. So I, I think we can learn a lot from, you know, theologically traditional churches in like liberal cities. And uh, you, I mean, you just, you have to address those questions. Mm-hmm. You can't avoid them. You know, maybe in Harlan, Kentucky, you can avoid that question. Whereas, you know, 
justified reference. Yeah, it, yeah, it's just great, by the way. It's a great show. But, yeah. <laughs> None against uh, Harlan. I like Harlan. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. Uh, my dad lived in Kentucky uh, back and forth uh, growing up. So I, I feel sort of a, a kindred spirit with <laughs> Harlan, Kentucky. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I think we can learn a lot from them uh, in that sense. Just like I came away from Wake uh, just with this idea, like the main thing I took away was I think there's there's something to the critique of the the traditional church of like you don't love people enough whereas they you know flip it around and it's like we only love people we sort of drop the you know jesus is god thing uh you know like i just look at that and i'm like it's both yeah right you know like we should love people because jesus is god so like (laughs) in that sense i think in the same way we can take a lot from churches in liberal cities and be like hey we need to address these conversations because otherwise you know people like me are going to run into that and some of them are probably not going to come out the other side uh with a podcast about theology (laughs) (laughs) sage if we know one thing it's that jesus was not clear on loving people correct he was very very murky yeah, he was very, fun. very, very wishy washy on the <laughs> <of> people that <laughs> <met> Jesus. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, well, Sage, uh, thanks for sharing, man. I appreciate the story. I don't know. I think, I think all these stories just show like when we don't allow questions and don't let people figure this stuff out, it sort of it just sets people up for a lot of pain. Because when they do start asking questions, they sort of feel like they have to throw the whole thing out when that's not true. Um, There is a lot of truth that is in the resurrection, right? That's, you know, like you were saying, Sage, there's a lot of the disciples, the apostles reaction and the world changing as a result of it, that, that is rooted in some semblance of, of truth, you know? Um, But yeah, I mean, that's our philosophy on the podcast, right? Is not, you know, your questions are are welcome. You have a place here and you um you can feel comfortable asking these and and please do. Um please do. Um all right. Well, shall we move on? Um all right. Uh, before we get started uh, or finish up here, I do want to bring up um, patreon.com slash bite size theology. Uh, if you like what you um, are hearing, hard to believe, but <laughs> if you do, um, and I don't know, and if you believe in, in our mission and what we're trying to do and, and ultimately and hopefully what God is trying to do um, through this group of nonsense people, um, <laughs> then feel free to help support us. We do have a way of, of doing that. And that's on our Patreon page. Feel free to subscribe to us at the $1 level if you want. Uh, if not, that's cool too, but it just helps, helps us metaphorically keep the lights on and also, um, and also try to uh, pursue other things and other projects and things like that within this and hopefully put out more content for you and, and try and figure out new things. So, so yeah, feel free to support us if you are interested and and thanks. Thanks for listening. All right. Um I'm getting confl- Yeah. <laughs> I'm getting an argument going on in the chat. <laughs> email land or not. I I'm gonna defer. I can't defer. I have to make a decision. Sage wrote in all caps, do it. All right, Sage, I'm passing it on to you. It's a, this needs to be a quick one. All right. Here we go. Somewhere on an island west of the archipelago, several emails have gathered together to form a nation unto their own, and it was called Email Land. You have now entered Email Land. Let's look at what the email civilians of Email Land are up to today. I have zero emails this week. <laughs> I have an email. This, okay. comes, this comes from Cody Smith. Actually, I don't know if uh, we've ever used his last name, so sorry about that, Cody. Uh, But I think there are a lot of Cody Smiths, so you should be fine. (laughs) So, the question today. If aliens invaded Earth, 
and you each had to choose one representative on behalf of the human race to hang out with the aliens and convince them not to destroy the planet, who would you choose and why? I will go first and let you all think. I think the obvious answer is Shaquille O'Neal. So why is that? Two things. First, he has an incredible personality. You could not be around him unless you're Kobe Bryant and not fall in love with him immediately. <laughs> and he and Kobe even made up uh, before the end, which is, is very sweet. Uh, so mine would be Shaquille O'Neal uh, in part because he's a wonderful person. Uh, seems very nice. And he's, he's a tall. giant and he will terrify them with his size because he's seven foot three, 350 pounds. <laughs> They'll be like, are they all like this? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and he will tell them we are. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going. I'm going, Dave Chappelle. If if like if you're looking for a good hang, you know, just somebody who you want to just chill with, like send Dave Chappelle up there. He'll make him laugh. It'll be funny as anything. He'll probably come back and get in trouble for things that he said. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my answer is Danny DeVito. Can you <laughs> sort of just to throw them off their game a little yeah. bit? <laughs> <laughs> They'd be like, this makes no sense. <laughs> honorable right. honorable mention, Donald Glover, Childish Gambino. Honorable yeah. Oh, absolutely. Oh, I'd send, yeah. yeah, I'd send him to do anything. Yeah, he's, he's good great. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, to anyone out there listening, uh, feel free to write in your questions because we do want to hear from you. They can be serious. They can be not serious. They can be theologically related. They could be not at all. Uh, they could they could be about people we'll send as a human representative to talk to aliens. I, you know, that's very theological. Yeah. So, but we do want to hear from you. Um, that's that's kind of what we hope to do on this podcast is is to sort of respond to you and your questions and. If you have any uh, that you want to submit, please do submit those. We would like to hear from you. Um, and you can do that on our website. It's at bitesizetheology.com slash contact. So that is bitesizetheology.com slash contact. And we will read your very own questions on the email and segment. Again, could be related to theology, could be something personal, could have nothing to do with any of that. Doesn't matter. We just want to hear from you. So without further ado, uh, we'll go ahead and wrap this up. We're clocking in at a high runtime for this one. <laughs> I think we'll probably get that throughout the, the whole series, to yeah. be honest. But, um, but thanks, everybody, for listening, and we will catch you on the next one.